the Dyslexia Life Hacks Show. I'm your host, Matthew Head, and in this episode, I'm talking to Brock Idy. Along with Fanette Idy, he is the author of The Dyslexic Advantage. This is a paradigm-shifting book that describes the neuroscience behind dyslexia and its unique brain structure. Now, 12 years on from its first publication, they have an updated and revised edition, includes new research, clarifies dyslexic strengths, and comes with new insights. As always, I'll put links to the book as well as other things we talk about in the show notes, which will be available at dyslexianlifehacks.com forward slash podcast. Welcome to the show, Brock. Thanks very much, Matt. Glad to be here. Excellent. So you're currently talking to me from London now because you're doing a bit of a tour to promote the book in the UK. That's right. But what I want to start with really is that um, you started off as physicians before you got into the world of dyslexia. So what did pique your interest in becoming a physician in the first place? So I think uh, wanting to become a doctor was sort of just a, a lifetime thing for me. I uh, remember as a child, um, just, uh, I don't know if it was maybe the esteem that my parents held the doctors in was part of it, but uh, <laughs> I was also fascinated by the fact that when something went wrong, that was the person that you, uh, that you went to to fix you up and patch you ah, up. Yeah. I was always interested in science, interested in the human body, and, and interested in people and their problems, and it just seemed like a great uh, field for me. Uh, Fernet's father was a doctor, and her grandfather was a doctor, and her great grandfather was a doctor. So it was a pretty. Oh, bloody! <laughs> <laughs> so she didn't walk in one day and go, "I want to be an engineer." <laughs> 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 ah, so that does bring me on to Fernet. How did the two of you meet? So we met when we were uh, medical interns at oh, the cool. hospital of the University of Pennsylvania in uh, in Philadelphia. And yeah. uh, Philadelphia is the city of uh, brotherly love by uh, by etymology, but uh, it's also pretty good for meeting your spouse. <laughs> I see. So yeah, <laughs> you're doing your internship, meet for that. Um, did you then start working together straight away? Or had you did you have your own careers before you sort of started putting no, things was, together? Yeah, it really took us. Uh, it, it took us probably 10 years before we started uh, working together. So um, Fournette was training as a neurologist and mm. uh, their first year before they begin doing uh, neurological brain specialization, uh, they, they actually learned to be a real doctor and uh, do a general, <laughs> general internship. And that was the year that we met. And uh, so I continued on with medical training and actually initially was training to be a cardiologist. Uh, oh, wow. But a series of, uh, of health problems got me out of, um, of cardiology and, and uh, uh, on a different track with more general medicine and, uh, and then philosophy of medicine and uh, medical ethics. And uh, Frenette continued on with neurology and was a junior faculty member at the University of Chicago in the Department of Neurology. And uh, at that time, we started having children. And our children oh, yeah. grew to the age where they started uh, attending school. And we started finding out that uh, that everything wasn't uh, going uh, exactly the way it's, uh, it's, it's uh, told you that it's going to go in the books. And we began looking uh, to try to understand what was going on with our children. And uh, that was really the, the birth of our interest in learning differences. And... Uh, uh, it, after probably about four or five years of that, we uh, we decided to make a full time uh, career out of that and and opened up our clinic together. Okay, so yeah, so you obviously, how much did you know about dyslexia before you had children and then found out they had neurodiversity? Was it something you were aware of during your medical career and medical learning? No. No, I, we really didn't have any training on it at all. And it's actually ironic because uh, dyslexia runs heavily in my family. But uh, Oh, really? Yeah, I, I had never realized when I was younger that uh, that actually my, my grandmother was very dyslexic. So uh, I would get these Christmas messages from her every year where she would spell my name differently. <laughs> every single year I was Brooke, I was Brock, I was B-R-O with a K, I was with a C, with every other thing. Uh, and uh, her son, my my father, uh, was also very dyslexic. He was an accountant, a certified public accountant, who was oh, wow. very successful uh, in his in his uh, business activities. But uh, uh, you know, I, I got a hold of his college report cards once, and he had straight A's in accounting and straight D's in basically all of his humanities <laughs> distribution courses and English right. and he was, uh, remedial <laughs> writing and all this sort of stuff. 
And, um, you know, we always thought of these things with my father as being sort of peculiarities. He was a very uh, kind of physically brave man. But the only time I ever saw him show real signs of fear when was when someone asked him to read uh, something out loud. So, you know, read, read to us before going to bed or read something at a family occasion, uh, you know, with uh, the night before Christmas poem or something like that. And he would uh, yeah. begin trembling. And, you know, I could never figure out why. Um, the first book I ever saw him read was when uh, he was 40 years old. And uh, oh, wow. I was uh, I was probably uh, 12 or 13 at that time. It was the first time he, he ever read a book for pleasure. So, you know, we didn't really have a name for dyslexia at that time. We didn't study dyslexia during our medical school years. Okay. Um, you know, I had a few peculiarities when I was young. I had a lot of uh, visual problems reading where the letters would bounce around on the page when the print got too small and that sort of thing. And I, I read very slowly, but I read accurately and, and never encountered serious academic problems, though, on the college uh, tests, I would never finish the reading sections and things like that, but it wasn't bad enough to really, uh, uh, you know, lead me to get uh, identified or diagnosed. But then when we had children, they, they had more uh, significant uh, challenges with learning to read and with spelling and that sort of thing. And that was when we began learning about dyslexia. Oh, okay. And do you think, was there any dyslexia on the uh, side of the family, just to kind of close this loophole once you started learning? Yeah, no, not not dyslexia, but they're not exactly neurotypical either. So <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are some things I think that are probably uh, related to to um, uh, dyspraxia and oh, okay. procedural learning, and uh, some elements uh, along with uh, processing speed and potentially some uh, attention related issues too. So uh, the convergence of our two rivers uh, made a mighty flood, as they say. Yes. Uh, the yes. young ones. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, uh, they, they inherited a lot of good things from both sides as well. So we're very happy about that. <laughs> good. Um, so how many children do you have just to kind of paint the picture? Uh, we have two. Uh, we lost one to cancer. The the other one is, uh, is now 28 and a uh, sort of budding um, children's book artist. So he's oh, got a oh, wow. little book agent running around New York trying to, uh, <laughs> to show um, one of his projects now. So we're, we're very excited about his career. Okay. So you sent both kids off to school and started to sense that one of them was struggling in academia. What then kind of led you down the path that this might be dyslexia or you discovered this thing called dyslexia because it's, you know, it must be coming home with school reports and struggling with the handwriting and all the stuff we know that young dyslexics struggle with when they start school. But what really started ringing bells in your head and leading you down the path? It was just the, uh, I think, the discrepancy between their ability to, to, uh, uh, to obviously think and speak and reason and be very smart young people, uh, their love of being read to, their love of stories, their love of creating their own stories. Uh, but then their difficulty then in, in engaging with uh, with printed text um, and uh, and also then on the written side, uh, just the the uh, difficulties of learning how to uh, to spell and to represent sounds and letters. Mm. And uh, that was that was really uh, you know pretty unexpected to us because neither one of us had uh, problems that were significant enough to come to attention. I've I've always been a flamboyantly bad speller. I think the nicest com uh, uh, comment I ever got from an English professor was, "It's a, it, it's a pity that your ideas, uh, that your spelling can't keep up with your ideas." Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I took that as a great compliment. But, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but neither one of us, uh, neither Fernet nor I, had enough uh, problems. Kind of in the early years that we that we sort of came to attention. Um, um, so, you know, we weren't, uh, we weren't expecting that our kids would, uh, would show special challenges, but it just, you know, goes to show the general, uh, level of ignorance, uh, with which we were, uh, uh, you know, educated, uh, regarding dyslexia and regarding learning in general. Yes. Yeah. And I can imagine that you, you kind of don't know what's going on, but what was your kind of first sort of, should we say? intervention with your children was it something one of the teachers recommended or was it something you guys were reading about and thinking oh this might help them out yeah it was really things that we we ended up finding because i think like many parents um you know the first uh 
the first stop was with the uh, the pediatrician, and you know, I don't know why we we expected the pediatrician who went to the same medical. <laughs> <laughs> and did all the same things we did was going to know anything about dyslexia but that was you know really barking up the wrong uh the wrong tree uh and then we you know went to uh to the educators and the teachers and they asked uh you know what they thought was going on and they were uh pretty much oh they're you know they're doing fine they're making progress they'll grow out of it uh, sort of thing, oh. but uh, you know, it just was it was clear to us that the discrepancy between what they were able to do uh, orally and what they were able to do conceptually, uh, and their ability to to read and write was just, um, w- you know, it was a phenomenon in need of an explanation. And yeah, uh, yeah. And so we went looking ourselves, and because we had access to the basic scientific literatures and to the the primary literatures, it didn't take us too long to to discover these other things. And, um, and I think, you know, one of the things that was interesting is that uh, some of the challenges manifested in different ways with our son and our daughter. So our son had a lot of difficulties with, uh, with auditory processing. And it was clear that his, uh, his ability to process spoken language was impacted in certain environments. So Mm. if there was background noise, if there were other things going on, he was really impaired with how you heard. Uh, Our our daughter didn't so much have background noise problems, but she had phoneme awareness problems. And so she would, uh, both when she was speaking and when she was listening, she would make a lot of substitutions uh, when she was younger and uh, just clearly mishear sounds. And, you know, when you're three or four and, uh, uh, you know, you're you're kind of making these subtle modifications to words. It's a little bit cute uh, when you're five and six and seven, and you're continually doing that. Yeah. It starts to get, uh, you know, to be an area of concern even for parents who don't know what they're doing. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, that was when we uh, when we really started um, uh, investigating these things and finding that these things were signs of of other things. But you know, when you go to approach a, an audiologist. Uh, uh, as a parent to try to figure out what this hearing issue is going on, they'll yeah. have one language to speak about it with, and a language specialist will have another one, and a reading specialist will have another one. And it just it occurred to us after a while that, uh, that there weren't many people that were bringing all of these approaches together and the things that, that were known in these different specialties and combining them. So I think that was our motivation for wanting to do that uh, ourselves, to be a conduit for parents that were facing these uh, these challenging kinds of things because uh, nobody just has a reading reading problem and nobody no. just has a, a, a hearing problem. The, the problems overlap in all these different areas. Yeah, yeah. Out of curiosity, was it your son or daughter you noticed dyslexia in first? Uh, our, our son first, just because he was older. Uh, our, our daughter was more classically dyslexic, where our son was really sort of dyslexic, dyspraxic. Uh, and, uh, as time has gone on, uh, he, he was able to master, uh, basic phonics fairly well once he got sort of into his, uh, his late single digit, uh, early teen years. Um, okay. and so now he doesn't really, uh, show many signs at all. He, he's able to, he has, you know, good phonological skills. He can spell well and, and other things. Whereas our daughter was really much more classically uh, dyslexic in terms of spelling and decoding and, and those kinds of things. So this, obviously, you're, you're saying you've got all these multiple resources and you know the problem kind of touches all these multiple resources that they all talk in different languages. Did that lead you and Fanet to start applying your medical brain to this to try and pull all this information together? And how did that first look like in the early days? Yeah, it, it absolutely did. And, uh, you know, it just involved uh, first us just kind of reading our our uh, our brains out. And, uh, you know, I remember waking up every morning uh, because, you know, Fredette was the typical concerned mother uh, in addition to being a professor of neurology. And uh, yeah. she would be staying up at night reading, uh you know, things online until two or three in the morning and looking for books and whatever. And I remember wake up every waking up every morning and having a new report on the things that uh, all the things she'd read after I'd gone to, gone to sleep that night. And, oh, wow. <laughs> uh, you know, I would sort of follow up, uh, but she was the sort of classic broad, 
uh, broad sweeper who would uh, find all the things of relevance. And then I would kind of follow after on the uh, interesting leads and sort of do the deep dive. And uh, that's kind of the way we've operated ever since uh, as well. And uh, it uh, it worked out really well in terms of uh, finding resources and approaches uh, to help our children, and uh, and that was really what uh, what got us into this. And then just the recognition from both the statistics in general, and then just our discussions with other parents that there were so many other people in the same um, in the same situation. And of course, this was still the fairly early years of the internet in the late nineties. And oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, so we were uh, we were meeting uh, uh, other parents um, on uh, chat groups and online groups that were organizing around some of these issues, and um, we just thought there was a real need, and uh, mm. and it was an area that was fascinating to us as well as being personally relevant, and uh, so that uh, that just got us deeper and deeper and deeper in, and. Uh, and that that uh, led us eventually to doing this full time. Yes, yes. And uh, <laughs> I guess you had the perfect workshop with two children to um, try some of the techniques on. Were there certain ones you were finding worked better for your son and your daughter, or was you always finding there were a blend needed all the time? Yeah, I think there were there were certainly different things that uh, that worked for each. Uh, our our son had a very uh, narrow working memory span and his procedural problems uh, were, were super challenging as well. So anything that involved uh, more drill type work uh, just did nothing for him at all. Yeah, Everything okay. had to be approached through understanding and through comprehension. Uh, whereas our daughter was uh, a better traditional learner in that sense. She could learn through practice and wrote things, worked a little better for her. Uh, and uh, so they they really, uh, I think, were fairly rarely helped by the same things. <laughs> <laughs> they were, uh, they were a, I think, a good introduction to this uh, field also, uh, by reinforcing the fact that we're not just talking about always a single thing when we're talking about dyslexia, but um, as we've talked about in the most recent update of our book, we're, dyslexia is kind of a, a spectrum of spectrums that, you know, and a multidimensional system uh, where, uh, you know, you're not just uh, varying in your position on a single spectrum, but on multiple spectra. And uh, that was really what we found early on with our own children. Yeah, something I've said quite a lot with different podcast guests is like no two dyslexics are the same. So yes. as, much, as much as they're common rhythmic beats, it, it all, all need different kind of things to help us along. <laughs> as you started applying these techniques to your children, did you start seeing their grades rocket up? Did that kind of give you a quite a nice feedback loop, loop then? You know, our son was uh, was impacted enough that we ended up homeschooling him uh, oh, from wow. very early on. So, uh, um, and to be honest, uh, in terms of academic problem progress in sort of basic skills things, uh, we didn't see much until he was in his early teen years, probably fifteen or sixteen, before he was able to really write and do mathematics and things like that. But at the same time, his um, his higher level cognitive abilities were really quite good. He was doing uh, actually some some college level coursework by the time he was eleven or twelve online, and uh, so he you know he was able to uh, to reason. He was able to think creatively. He was able to do a lot of these higher cognitive things um, quite early. But uh, there was just an enormous gap between those and his ability to do. Anything that involved steps, anything that involved rote learning, anything that involved uh, learning through practice. And so I think he was a, a great introduction into uh, uh, the fact that, uh, that learning, long-term learning, really can be achieved through different systems. Uh, whereas our daughter did uh, did begin to academically progress early and uh, was quite uh, good at mathematics. So uh, it's interesting that like many uh, dyslexic students, um, she succeeded uh, uh, primarily through instruction plus bribery. So she, <laughs> okay. she, was a, 
very strong interest-based learner. And one of the things that really interested interested her very much was uh, was getting financial rewards. Uh, so they, <laughs> they were not big, but uh, <laughs> but uh, they they involved gamification, so that there were uh, there were pluses for success and minuses for uh, for mistakes. And so uh, I, I remember the joy on her face before we initiated the uh, the give and take program when she came to us and said. Wow, I got fifty percent right. That's pretty good, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so we said, well, we can we can aim a little higher than that. So uh, if you if you get a little higher, you'll uh, you'll do a little better next time. And so uh, uh, she ended up uh, having a, a deep interest in learning game theory. Actually, so she was oh, uh, okay. <laughs> she was uh, very interested in that in that sort of uh, risk analysis, give and take sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that instruction plus bribery. <laughs> Brilliant. Which chapter is that in instruction plus bribery? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, the, that's the next book, I think. <laughs> well, yeah, I've got a name for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, yourself and Finette now find yourself within the world of dyslexia. You've got your own business running on it. Let's sort of skip along to. Well, but let's jump across the stones that got you to actually releasing a book on dyslexia. How how was the business looking at before then? And what then started to think, well, maybe I should put this into a book? Yeah. So, you know, initially, uh, we weren't even entirely specialized on dyslexia. We were just interested in helping people with learning challenges in general. Um, I think what drew us specifically to dyslexia over time, though, and, you know, it's really been uh, our main focus for the last probably 13, 14 years, uh, was that uh, just the simple observation that uh, that we weren't simply seeing the same set of challenges over and over again or the same, you know, the same range of challenges. Not that we were seeing the same ones in every child, as we've already talked about, but the same, the same basic set of challenges. We were also seeing the same sets of strengths, not just in the children, but also in the families. And I think we were aided to some extent by our practice structure because there were two of us. One of us spent uh, an awful lot of time sitting and talking to the parents and the families uh, when the other was in the room examining the child. And then we'd swap off and each do the other thing. So I think Uh, we ended up just doing much more historical background work with the families and hearing the family stories much more. And uh, it was clear to us that we were seeing these these patterns of strengths over and over and over again, both in the children and in the parents. And uh, that was uh, that was what led us to uh, kind of dive into the, the scientific and medical literature and look and see if there was any support um, elsewhere for uh, this notion that there are advantages that are linked to dyslexia. Uh, or if there are explanations in terms of brain structure or in terms of the cognitive research on dyslexia that might suggest uh, that there was a reason to think that dyslexic people might have these advantages. And uh, it was the the fact that we were able to find those kinds of things that led us to write the book. Yes, yeah. So let's go, because you know, the book is why you're here, to be honest. So let's start deep diving into the book. Um, how long did it take you to write and how did you and Finette split the kind of um, task of writing up? Because obviously, Finette's more into the neuroscience than you are anyway. So is she the one that does all the deep, deep work into the detail? How does it look when you're writing? No, we, we split up. So uh, during my medical training, I did I did seven years in basic science uh, research. So I, I'm a pretty wonky person also. Um, and uh, uh, But... Basically, the way that the, the, the book writing came down. So this was the second book that we published. And mm. we, we sort of worked out our, our cooperative methodology on the first one. And <laughs> what she's really good at is finding connections between things in the literature and kind of doing a, doing a, big, um, a big sweeping search of things and finding all the sort of possibly relevant things. And uh, sweeping that in, and then 
I'm I'm good at sort of organizing things and systematizing things and creating a structure for them, and uh, also storytelling. So I did a, an awful lot of um, uh, writing earlier in my career, uh, also that was a little bit more narrative in format. And so, uh, you know, I'm pretty much the guy that puts all the words onto the page. But before any word goes down, uh, we'll both have read all of the relevant papers and discussed them and thought through the ideas. Um, you know, so Fernet's the one, for example, that came up with the whole mind strength concept. Um, and, uh, you know, and then I, I uh, sort of organized things onto paper. Um, I think in terms of kind of our recent uh, things, the, the, the things uh, dealing with the uh, the neural systematization things in the in terms of the connection of the mind strengths that we talked about in the in the other book, uh, some of that was uh, was a little bit more uh, my work this time. Uh, but Fernet's also, I think, much better in terms of the practical clinical applications of things. She's really, uh, you know, I think that's her strongly uh, maternal side. Um, uh, and she really, she really thinks in terms of what all this means for people, how to uh, uh, help. Uh, she's much better at keeping up with the assistive technology things and and uh, uh, the classroom, what's going on in the classrooms at typical schools and and the educational techniques and things like that. Where I think I get a little bit more theoretical on things. <laughs> at okay. Times. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it's a, it's been a, a naturally good partnership. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think we each end up with our own things because of what we love to do rather than because the other one just doesn't want to do it or <laughs> is pushing us in that direction. So Yeah. Oh, no, that's cool. And it's great that the two of you are, can work as a team and have different strengths to build into it because that just ultimately builds a better book at that point, doesn't it? So there's, if anybody's listening who hasn't read the Dyslexic Partners, you'll listen to it if you can get it downloaded on Audible. Um, just step us through what sort of things are touched on it. Um, like a brief sort of, uh, I guess, what's written on the back cover kind of thing. Yeah, so I, I think the basic, you know, the biggest big picture uh, explanation of what the book is about, it, it really presents the notion that uh, dyslexia is not uh, fundamentally best understood as a disability, but what it really represents is uh, a kind of brain specialization in uh, in certain kinds of functions that bring about uh, uh, strengths as well as challenges. And th the reason that so many people are dyslexic is because there's uh, there's an advantage to the human population of having a significant number of people who are wired this way. Uh, they they create a cooperative advantage for, for human society as a whole uh, by the strengths that they bring and the ability to compensate for some uh, some weaknesses that people have because they uh, focus too well and because they're too organized uh, that they miss out on the opportunities to be creative and to think in different ways and to take new approaches. So that's really the, the message of the book. So yeah, so that's kind of the back cover synopsis of the book. But you are quite unique at that point in time in seeing these advantages. So how were you able to pull everything together from the literature to start I guess seeing the pattern recognition, which is a dyslexic student for start, <laughs> that um, started you thinking, well, actually, this is not a deficit thing or anything like that. We are now seeing a strength of dyslexia and um, pulling it all together into sort of a coherent thought. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the beginning of all this, I mean, I remember when we actually had the thought of, uh, of trying to uh, to organize and systematize our observations that we actually went up to, you know, we're from Seattle, of course, so we went up to a Starbucks and just uh, course, yeah. bought, a couple, <laughs> bought a couple of lattes and went and sat down at a, a table outside. It was, uh, that was, that's atypical for Seattle, but the weather was good enough that day that we could sit outside. Uh, and we just started talking uh, about all of the dyslexic people that we worked with and all of the strengths that they showed. And uh, once we'd made the list, we went through and and uh, tried to see if they seemed to organize themselves in certain ways. And we came up with these four patterns uh, uh -huh. around spatial reasoning, around connection making, around storytelling, and around future prediction. And uh, then Fred was 
the one who came up with the whole mind concept uh, for that. And um, we we then at that point uh, wanted to see if there was any reason to think that these uh, that these patterns had any uh, any any relevance or any coherence aside just from our own perception of them um, hanging together. And so we looked basically at, at three different levels in our research literature. We looked at research on dyslexic brain structure and function, uh, brain structure prim- uh, initially. So were there things about dyslexic brains and the way that they were put together uh, that suggested that they might show a, a strength uh, challenge correspondence there might be a uh, you know single brain differences that could explain both benefits and challenges arising from uh from those single benefits because you know in in science you're always looking for a, a simple explanation so rather than looking for multiple things happening simultaneously at the same at the same time you know you don't want uh, a theory that requires you to have uh, two lightning strikes at the same at the same instant. You want yes. to base it on one. Uh, at the second level, we looked at the uh, the cognitive uh, level or at the at the brain functional levels. So uh, things that involve brain processing or the ability to perform different kinds of cognitive tasks. Uh, and we looked in that literature to see if there were things that supported the different strength patterns that we had found. And then we looked also at uh, kind of the real world literature. So there's literature that looks at um, what dyslexic people uh, have achieved in life, uh, what uh, kinds of, uh, of careers they've they've gravitated into, uh, what sort of schooling programs they pursue and uh, look to see if there was evidence supporting these kinds of uh, categories based on those sorts of differences. And the idea was that we were creating a sort of a three-dimensional matrix. um, And if we could see the same talent sets going through those three levels, uh, kind of mutually supporting each other, then uh, that would be a very high indication a very strong indication that uh, we were looking at real patterns and not simply at things we made up. And we found those for each of the mind strengths. Okay, that's cool. And did this epiphany moment over coffee fuel the renaissance? Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's always good. Um, what was the response to that at the time? The book had come out, and at the time, I understand it's quite novel thinking. What, yes. Did you get much pushback and response to it? Um, You know, actually much less than we anticipated. Oh, really? You know, so there's, there's, I think, two questions, two, two ways to ask the question. One, uh, one where we treated in a friendly and respectful manner by, by the academic research community uh, to that. Definitely. Yes. We've had a lot of people that have invited us uh, to do things uh, and, uh, uh, we organized a number of conferences around dyslexic strengths and had many very, very uh, eminent um, and highly qualified people come from the academy to participate in those. So uh, we've been treated very respectfully and very collegially by people in the academy. In terms of have we seen as much uh, the, uh, as much generation of other people doing research on the dyslexic strengths as we would like? I think there the answer is is no. Uh, I would qualify that by saying that the uh, the older generation, which now very sadly includes us uh, because of <laughs> the way it works, uh, we were the young mavericks uh, 12 years ago. We're now uh, entering the, the fuddy-duddy stage of our careers. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, people people our age, I think, have, have not picked up the banner, but we're seeing many, many people that are, uh, you know, that, that have gone through training during years where our, our book was already out there that have been eager to begin studying these things. And so we're seeing a lot more work that's being done by, by younger people. And, um, you know, Max Planck, the, uh, the physicist and uh, really one of the originators of quantum theory had this wonderful, well, kind of morbid actually, uh, uh, saying that uh, science advances one funeral at a time. And it's just a recognition of the fact <laughs> yeah. Well, old dogs don't learn new tricks and that uh, scientific theories generally change as one generation 
uh, passes off the scene and another generation uh, comes on who's more open to new ideas. And I think that's, you know, that's what we're, uh, that's what we're really witnessing that, uh, uh, you know, as the years go by uh, and these things become more obvious, um, uh, not just through the research that's done within the dyslexia community, but in the, the research in, um, in related fields. So creativity studies, I think over the last 10 years has been a huge one. And just uh, the the system that works around, uh, around episodic memory has been an incredibly rich research area over the last 12 years. And as people within the dyslexia field finally become aware of these things, which really haven't been on anybody's radar at all, uh, I, I think there's just no way that they'll, they'll uh, not become more interested in this because the, the case for the connection between dyslexia and these kinds of strengths has become dr- dramatically stronger in the last 12 years. And um, I think it's really undeniable at this point. It is, it is. And the general conversation around neurodiversity and particularly dyslexia has really shifted to the fact that we're openly posting on social media platforms about dyslexic strengths, which must excite you very much, I would have thought. Yes. And, you know, we've seen other changes in the last 12 years that I think are equal equally encouraging. So when we were uh, writing the first edition of the book, we made a very strong effort to try to find as many women as we could to interview and also to uh, to reach out to people in underrepresented minority groups uh, to get them to participate. And we were not able to get very many folks in those categories to participate. And the traditional response was, you know, I already have uh, these other strikes against me, uh, in, and I just don't have the social capital to expend by being public about about my dyslexia at this time because uh, you know I just I just don't think that uh, the, that we can do all this. And I think you know I, I think there's been some some obviously public movement in terms of uh, of advances for uh, for ethnic minorities and women in the last 12 years but the the responses that we received this time i think were even even greater than we would expect based on those advances by themselves and also represent the changing in people's willingness to be seen as being dyslexic now i think people are in fact uh, more comfortable with that i think it's not perceived as as much of a stigma as it has been uh, generally, although there there still are many cases where people do experience the sense of stigma. But I think I think we're seeing uh, the beginnings of a change where where more people are willing to talk about being dyslexic themselves. Yes, yeah, and I've certainly found actually during my sort of career and stuff that being open about it, being dyslexic has helped my career greatly. It's funny how. The mind shift around it from being this thing you hide and don't want to talk about to actually something that's just part of me changes other things as we go along. Yeah, and I think that's a wonderful thing. We found it just extremely encouraging. And, uh, you know, it's it's nice to think that our book might have played a, a part in that. It's it's clear that the willingness of uh, of people like Richard Branson to come out and, uh, you know, and, and talk about being dyslexic and, you um, you know, other other popular uh, uh, celebrities and media figures, uh, you know, the work of other organizations and groups uh, besides our Dyslexic Advantage organization. But, um, you know, groups like Made by Dyslexia and mm. uh, this British Dyslexia uh, Association over here has done great work for a long time. Uh, the Dyslexia Arts Trust, there have been a number of really great groups in the United Kingdom that have, uh, over the years, uh, popularize this notion that there is a connection between dyslexia and talent. So we certainly haven't been alone in that field, um, but it's nice to see that the momentum seems to be building. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And it just seems to be the ball's getting stronger all the time, I think. Like, well, yeah, I started a new job recently and everybody's so sort of welcoming of it. And I remember when I first started my career and I worked in STEM, so it's more likely there anyway. That <laughs> So wow, this is different. How how it sort of walked through. I mean, you can't miss it on my CV. The fact I present this podcast doesn't <laughs> gives it away, I suppose. <laughs> so, what led you to build up to writing the second edition? What what did you? Why did you sort of think? Oh, this needs an update. You know, there there was just so much new research that was relevant to understanding dyslexic strengths and the mind strengths, um, and. 
just about all of it. Uh, you know, there, there's been some dyslexia related research directly that's been important. And we talk about that in the book, but uh, there was even more research outside of the dyslexia area that was relevant to the mind strengths. Uh, and it really was not on anybody else's radar. And we knew that if we didn't do it, nobody else would, would do it either. <laughs> okay. It was all that that uh, research around again around creativity, around the use of episodic memory. Um, I, I think the big thing for us was that it became obvious that uh, the mind strengths uh, had been revealed by the research that had taken place in the intervening years as being four manifestations of the same underlying uh, set of cognitive uh, systems and networks. Uh, and different abilities. So, um, you know, just like with a, a tool, uh, you know, a, a driver for a drill, you can put a drill head on it, or you can put a screwdriver head on it, or a polisher, or a sander, or any any kind of a, a, a tool, but it's the same power source that drives all of those. And the function that you get out of it just depends on what you're linking it to. In the cases of the mind strengths, it really looks that uh, like whether you're getting uh, M strength, spatial reasoning, or I strength, uh, ability to think in connections and systems, N strength, ability to think in stories, D strength, ability to make predictions. All of those things are driven by the same ability to use personal memory to create complex mental simulations. So it's opposed to using step-by-step reasoning, rules, formulas, equations to, to do your reasoning. Uh, you're, you're actually kind of creating mental scenarios in mind and envisioning them. Um, it's the reason why show your work, uh, you know, explain in words exactly <laughs> what went on uh, in your thinking to get you to that point uh, is not a simple process to do because you're not, uh, you're not going through steps. You're not doing something in a linear fashion. You're actually envisioning something. And it's a very different process. Yes, yes, you are right. And um, it's quite interesting how it all comes together, doesn't it, with um, like doing stuff where you can go from A to Z and bounce off R and it back into C because yeah. how a dyslexic brain is able to pull that together and like my background in engineering, the amount of key people that have come along before me that have done that and worked out new things. And it's funny how the brain kind of works like that. Yeah, and absolutely. I imagine you must have seen this excitingly in your children when you were training them through these. Like, hey, this thing starts to happen. <laughs> How yeah, did you come up with that? Oh, that's a brilliant idea. But oh. <laughs> yeah, and I think that that um, you know one of the biggest challenges that we've seen with uh, with dyslexic people is you know for example uh, you know we've talked a lot about entrepreneurship other people have talked a lot about entrepreneurship and one of the big challenges that uh, that people in business in general have is that if you if you say you know i know we should do this because i can see it i have this i have this image i see how it all fits together and i know it works but i can't tell you exactly why i know that you know you're you can get away with that if you're the boss, if you're the one who calls the shots, if you're the owner, if you're the the founder, but not if you're the middle manager. And yeah. uh, you know, this is why we, you know, we, we see so many people in entrepreneurship, number one, because of this talent set, this ability to see the future and envision opportunities other people miss. But we also see a lot of people in entrepreneurship because the people that have a business bent, uh, people like my my daughter who are heavily motivated by uh, my <laughs> Rewards, um, <laughs> you know, know that they're not going to find success by becoming the mid-level manager at a at a mega company in many uh, in many instances, and so they they look for opportunities independently that they can exercise. Um, and uh, you know, this is uh, this this is the kind of thing that we hear again and again from from the people that we work uh, work with is that you know I know where we need to go, but I just can't explain it to the other people but a month yeah. or two later after we've been doing this now they see it too and if you know we've always had this feeling where we may not be able to show everybody else the other steps but we may be able to help legitimize the notion that somebody can have a completely rationally developed reason 
for pursuing a particular decision or a particular object or end that they can't explain to somebody else, but they, they arrived at uh, through a through a legitimate and trustworthy manner of thinking. So, um, you know, it's there's kind of an asymmetry for people with dyslexia and non-dyslexic people. And the people with dyslexia uh, typically understand what what linear thinking looks like and what logical <laughs> thinking looks like and and how it can be successful. But yeah. um, but people who are very linear in their orientation do not have the ability to understand nonlinear thinking and to understand that it can be a legitimate form of, uh, of reasoning and coming up with, uh, with new ideas and decisions. So we've always wanted to try to redress that balance and help the linear people to understand that, you know, that um, these people aren't just uh, making blind leaps or uh, having gut feelings about something, but that they're actually engaging in a, in a process of, of um, uh, using experience in a creative and, um, and, and cogent and trustworthy way. Yes. And there's something really interesting you touched on there. I remember quite a few years ago trying to learn this world. So I'd sort of understood my own dyslexia was that, how do I explain stuff to people who aren't dyslexic? Because it's like my particular strength is being able to think in 3D and use a lot of visual skills. Um, so I can have stuff on a cab package screen and it's all over the place. And I'm like, well, it's going to do this by the end of it. All I need to do is get the program to do what I want. <laughs> Great. And now it goes together. I can take it part of my mind. But try and explain to somebody else who does, I guess, yeah. think more linearly or is not a dyslexic person was a, a whole new skill set I had to learn. <laughs> yeah, and that whole communication piece. Uh, but even to give you, even to give you the time to pursue things that you can't show on the screen, uh, you know, if your if your boss has some trust in that, or your colleagues have some trust in that, that uh, that creates an entirely different environment than uh, than than uh, you know if they're really skeptical about anything that you do that you can't show yet. Um, yeah yes yes yeah yeah prove it well, uh, give yeah. me a day <laughs> yeah, mocking things up on other things to sort of show the thinking uh, goes down quite well so based off the back of your book really i just thought there's a lot of, sort of dyslexic coaching programs going around now what are your thoughts on them have you used various different methods to sort of highlight strengths to i don't want to use the word weaknesses but i guess that is the pilot to strength so it feels like the right language to use because we do know being a dyslexic person, sometimes it's just things you're not great at, but then the, the mind is giving you other stuff that you are. And then there's all this coaching that hopefully brings up, well, either highlights the strength or helps use some of them strengths to kind of get past, get through, how to take a different look on weaknesses of dyslexia. What are your thoughts on that? I think the uh, the whole coaching field has made a lot of strides in recent years. I mean, I think it's wonderful in the United Kingdom that uh, that there are resources for employees, uh, you know, at least some resources provided by the government um, to get some training and to get some uh, some help with assistive technologies and things like that. Um, I think we're probably still further along on helping to manage the weaknesses than we are in uh, in leveraging the strengths. Mm. And I think that the uh, the concept among employers that there is a uh, identifiable set of uh, of strengths that we can begin to think about leveraging in our dyslexic employees is something that hasn't that hasn't penetrated very far yet um, because the resources haven't been there for employers to really understand that. Um, that's certainly I think the area that going forward for Ned and I. Uh, are really thinking heavily about uh, trying to make some impact on because I think at this point the uh, the whole neuroscience behind the dyslexic advantages is clear enough to be translated into language that uh, uh, you know has enough practical applications that it can be explained simply it can be uh, in in some ways automated for uh, for managers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, you know, put into sort of a no-fail kind of form where uh, it doesn't require a lot of uh, of insight, but just development of practices to be able to accommodate uh, these strengths and give people space to use them. Yeah. Um, 
So we did put a whole chapter on work in this edition of the book to sort of begin the conversation of thinking about how to apply mind strengths in different settings. But um, I think there's an enormous amount of work that can be done. And all of this is going to involve actually uh, listening and talking to people and finding out uh, what they've learned already. Because we have, you know, if 20% of people are dyslexic or, you know, somewhere between 10 and 20% of the people, we have, you know, 500 million laboratories out there running this yes. experiment. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the fact that uh, there's so little interest in uh, in learning from those experiments or collecting the data uh, is amazing. But, uh, uh, you know, I, just as an example, in the last um, in the last month or two, we've been hearing back from so many people in the dyslexic community who have begun using chat GBT. Yes. And, uh, yeah. You know, when we when. When people hear that, uh, the sort of, you know, traditional educators and employers and whatever, the usual response is sort of horror that yeah. uh, all of the dyslexic people are going to want to use chat GPT to, to cheat and basically let it do all their work for them. And I, you know, the, the, our response is always, well, you obviously don't know many dyslexic people if you think that they're going to let a machine speak for them. because. <laughs> <laughs> if, uh, if there was ever a group of people that didn't want to let other people put words into their mouth, this is the group. You know, yeah. it's, uh, it's people with ideas and uh, and opinions that they're wanting to get out, but they're having difficulty with the uh, the mechanical process of putting them in a linear form on the paper. And the amazingly creative ways that we've heard from the dyslexic folks that we work with to use Chat GPT. It's just astonishing, and none of them involve what what anyone would recognize as cheating. You know, it's uh, it's things like well, when my instructor asks me to do a, a two page essay on on this sentence topic, my mind just goes in all directions, and I can't remotely think of what a two page essay would look like. Well, if you enter that into Chat GPT and say, you know. Uh, show me what a two-page essay for, you know, at an eighth grade level or a 12th grade level or at a college level would look like on this topic. It'll spit it out. And what this, what the student uses is not all the information in the paper, but the example of what the range, what the scope, what the mm. level of detail is that will fit into two pages. And then they they use that as a template to put their own ideas in. Yes, uh, yeah. Or something like, you know, these are the 10 ideas that I want to express in a two page paper written at such and such a level. Can you help me to write that? And so it's all their ideas. It's all their original thinking. It's all their content. And once it's down on the page, they can go back, reformat it, edit it, make changes or whatever. But it gets them off that blank page thing. It gets them off that you know, I can I could write a 300-page book on this, but I can't write a two-page essay. Help me to, you know, help me to understand what the size and the scope of the project I need to do is. And this is the kind of learning that needs to take place now. Uh, it is really this kind of practical, uh, practical learning um, at, at kind of ground level in terms of actual daily tasks that people are facing. Yes, definitely, and it's it is, and I think. I haven't really dived into Jet GPT too much yet, but it's a really interesting bit of software. And I think it's interesting. I remember at uni not being able to get stuff out of my mind on the page. You know, it's a motorway in my head, but it comes off a small B road or a small side road. Um, and using like text, a uh, speech to text software to basically dump everything on the like, Then I had something to edit. If it's stuck in my brain, I can't do anything with it. It's just stuck in my head. <laughs> so, and I think. Creative people are going to use ChatGPT creatively to be able to get through that kind of initial thing, is not it? Because I, from my understanding, you don't go, I want to write an essay on I don't know, quantum theory. It would just spit 5,000 words out and you submit it the next day because that's not what people are doing. But as you said, you use that. And I've heard it's quite good for proofreading, spelling and grammar and checking your language looks properly. Okay. So, uh, you know, what ChatGPT does is it provides organization for people who are creative. But there is no chat GPT analog that provides creativity for people who are organized. So, you know, this is really an opportunity for people with dyslexia, um, people with ADHD to get a leg up 
on, uh, you know, the, uh, the less creative community, uh, we'll, we'll put it that way. Uh, you know, we were just giving a lecture, uh, up at, uh, GCHQ, uh, headquarters mm. uh, yesterday, uh, to their, uh, their affinity group for people with dyslexia. And, uh, you know, it was fascinating hearing their perspective on this as well. Um, in their, their intern group that they recruit, um, they have about 40% people with dyslexia because the skills that they're looking for are skills of people who are good at thinking off the, the beaten tracks of taking new perspectives of looking at things from different, um, diff- different perspectives and bringing new light on things. And, uh, you know, I think increasingly uh, we're going to see that um, that all of the skills that can be automated will be automated, and it's going to be these things that only the human mind at this point can can still do. Yeah. That are yes. you know, um, you know, I was sitting on the uh, train coming into London today across from a, a guy that was uh, reading a manual on how to play the uh, the game Go, uh, okay. which is you know a very complex game, but even though it's an extremely complex game, it's reducible entirely to calculations. And uh, for the first edition of our book, we talked to a guy named Demis Sasabis, who at that time was a postdoctoral fellow here at University College London, who was working on episodic memory. And he gave us a fantastic uh, interview on episodic memory. Uh, and in the years after that, he left, uh, formed a company called Deep Mind which uh, was an artificial intelligence company, sold that to Google for several hundred million dollars, uh, joined Google as their director of artificial intelligence and developed uh, the program that uh, allowed uh, DeepMind to beat any Go champion in the world. And uh, Demis himself actually was a three-time, I think, world champion in the, in the Go game. But, uh, you know, that's a skill uh, you know, sitting across from this guy, I was thinking to myself, I wonder if he knows that, uh, you know, that uh, there's no way he'll ever be able to beat the computer, you know, <laughs> <It's like laughs> give you a sense of futility to to engage in uh, in doing that. Uh, you know, why not read a book of poetry and go out and write some, try to write some poems because uh, you'll never find a computer that can do that as well as you because it will never have experienced the things that you've experienced. And I think we're reaching the stage where the premium for work is going to be with people who can bring value to mm-hmm. to things through creativity, through novelty, through making connections that other people haven't made before. And, uh, you know, that these other things, things that can be automated will be automated. And um, it's it's increasingly going to be important to learn how to leverage these strengths. And for people yes. with this yes. idea, Use the technologies to get over the weaknesses, focus on your strengths, build those, you know, educators, education systems, start thinking in that direction because there is literally next to no reason to uh, to be overstressed by the fact that you have some students who can't learn to read by, uh, by age nine or 10 or 11 because they can be supported in ways that will allow them to achieve even without that. Uh, it's good to continue trying to do that because... Uh, There still are uh, prejudices. There still are situations where we need to learn to read now, but we should be moving in this direction of of optimizing development of strengths and uh, and compensating for areas of challenge in in ways that don't uh, that don't bring a lot of stress, that don't distract and detract from the ability to educate the strengths. Mm. Yes, and it's going to be scary when people like Microsoft have that kind of algorithms and stuff in Microsoft <laughs> Word, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. I remember when spe- speech and text was a specialist program, and now it's in Word, you know. <laughs> 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 but, yeah, you are right. And I remember seeing it years and years ago about other things when they bring it all, automation into the workspace, like you know, manuf- manufacturing and stuff. It's like that's where the economy will go. The economy will go to the mind economy with creativity rather than just being able to, sort of repeatedly do a task and if you're a creative already and it's baked in and that should, it's a brave new world isn't it that's right <laughs> ride the ride the wave because it's uh it's flowing in your direction so. exactly exactly right so every guest that go, comes on this podcast as we come towards a close 
get three rapid fire questions. They are quick questions from me, but don't necessarily need rapid fire answers from yourself. Now, I'm going to be interested to say these ones, seeing as you wrote the book on dyslexia. But the first one is, what prejudice have you had about dyslexia that's been proven wrong? That uh, that it's impossible to achieve outstanding success in uh, even in workplace situations that require generally require interaction with text without the ability uh, developing the ability to read yourself. Yes, yeah. we've seen some people that were never able to learn to read at a competent level that that nevertheless succeeded in highly literate literacy demanding fields using assistive technology. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's really cool. And the second question, rapid fire, that is, is if an A landed and you had to describe dyslexia to them, how would you do it? I'd say these are the people whose brains have been organized to make them our explorers, uh, our people that go out and learn new things, our creators, and our people that, uh, that make us adaptable and help us to respond to change and, uh, and, uh, and challenge. Yes. <laughs> yes, the explorers and creators comes up quite a lot. And I, think, I like that idea of this, that maybe at a previous time it was the kind of the mindset to have, and then it's kind of changed as our world's changed, and maybe our world's changing back to that direction as technology assists us with things. Okay, last question of the podcast. And seeing as this podcast is called The Dyslexia Life Hack Show, what is your favorite dyslexic life hack? And you can't say read your book. <laughs> I think the I think the the best life hack is find the people find the people who compliment you with with the uh, this won't help to say, but compliment with an E instead of an I, but <laughs> the people who complete you. Rather than uh, uh, than just surrounding yourself with other people who are who are just like you, even though they're often more entertaining. So, I think um, one of the things that um, that uh, you know, one of the mistaken interpretations of our book is, uh, I think, saying that think that. Um, uh, Dyslexia is just uh, an all-around superior way to live. And for example, after the first book, we were contacted by a, a very successful sort of billionaire industrialist in the United States who was dyslexic and said, you know, this is great. I think I'm going to start a new company that's going to employ all dyslexics. And we were like, well, you know, for some of the jobs, yes. For, you know, for other jobs, no. Because in reality, I think the, I think the beautiful message of neurodiversity that it's coming out is that we're meant we're we're designed we're uh, you know we've we've been formed to work in teams to work in partnerships to work in pairs and the people that we found that are the happiest most well adjusted often are people that have found their teams and it doesn't mean that every person in your life has to be different from you we've seen many many successful families and marriages with two dyslexic uh, parents yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know they they uh, they find ways to to um, you know, to do the the organization functions and things like that. Uh, but then in other places in their life, it they'll have uh, you know people that are uh, bring other organizational skills and things, and and um, uh, you know will profit that way. But in general, uh, you know, find find use. Think about teams. Think about how you fit into teams. Think about yeah. um, you know the people you can bring in to help uh, with things. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And I think like the, the synergistic relationship that a group of people can have you know we don't want an orchestra where everybody plays the violins <laughs> yeah. learn, learn to communicate what you bring to the group as well yeah yes definitely. i think you know being learn to be a good evangelist of your movies is key yes yes okay so before we sign off where can people find the dyslexic advantage book um if they want to buy it or listen to it and then where can people find you so, uh, you know, coming from Seattle, uh, in addition to Starbucks, we have Amazon. So uh, <laughs> Amazon.com. But also, uh, you know, most uh, most standard booksellers uh, will will have it um, uh, for um, for the audio version. I think it's being released in the United Kingdom on April 6th. So if you're better 
with recorded books that'll be coming out soon. We we tried hard to get a more animated, uh, uh, easier to listen to narrator this time around. I think uh, <laughs> the plates the guy was a little bit flat last time, so <laughs> that would be better. Uh, and uh, uh, for other information about what we do, uh, dyslexicadvantage.org, uh, our okay. nonprofit organization website is a great uh, research uh, is, is a great uh, resource excellent and I will put links to all of that in the show notes and I'm particularly excited about the audio edition coming out in the UK because um, that tends to be how I consume that kind of information so it's great yeah. you've got a speaker a good speaker um, <laughs> did you approach Stephen Fry first of all? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish, uh, I wish there, they, they didn't give us uh, unlimited choice on that one. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, there's so many great dyslexic uh, people we could have had to read as well. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. Oldman and Paul Bettany and uh, yeah. all those other dyslexic actors. But, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, as I say, not, not unlimited budget, but you know, it's great. So, well, <laughs> That leads me to thank you very much for taking the time, Brock, to uh, your very busy UK tour to come and talk to me on this. And it's been really fun talking to you and really interesting delving into all the background behind the book as well as what the book represents. It's great. Thanks. It's been a real pleasure, Matt. Thanks for having me. No problem at all. And I want to thank everybody else for taking the time to listen. I will speak to you in the next episode. Goodbye for now.